an exhaustive dissection demonstration of the abdominal thoracic diaphragm. The first thing to understand is that this whole thing is the diaphragm and this was covered by a thick layer of fascia and that is the endo-abdominal fascia. And on top of that was a layer of parietal peritoneum and in between there was a little bit of fat. The parietal peritoneum continues on the undersurface of the diaphragm, it continues onto the abdominal wall, posterior wall and the fascia, endo-abdominal fascia continues down as the transversalis fascia on both the sides. So we had to remove them and we can see part of it here which we have removed. That took quite a bit of dissection. And after removing that, we could see the muscles and the tendons of the diaphragm. So this is the right dome of the diaphragm. This is the left dome of the diaphragm. This was related to the right anatomical lobe of the liver. This was related to the fundus of the stomach. We have removed all that. So let's take a look at what we can see here. We can see that there's a central portion here. This central portion is the tendon, central tendon of the diaphragm. And inserting onto the central tendon of the diaphragm, we have this muscular portion here. If you look closely, this is the muscular portion, the peripheral muscular portion. This is the peripheral muscular portion. So the muscular portion is divided into three parts. The anterior portion is the sternal part, which comes from the sternum. This is the sternum and gets inserted onto the central tendon. Then we have the costal part. This is the left costal part and we can see the direction of fibers very clearly. And this is the right costal part and we can see the direction of fibers going from the ribs towards the central tendon. And then we have the lumbar part. The fibers going from the lumbar vertebrae to the central tendon. This is on the right side. And when we look on the left side, we see the fibers running from the lumbar vertebrae to the central tendon. So these are the fibers which get inserted onto the central tendon. So if you look at the direction of fibers and look at them inserting onto the central tendon, we get an idea of how the diaphragm works. When these muscles contract, they pull on the central tendon from both the sides and therefore the central tendon becomes more flat. In other words, the domes of the diaphragm descend down and that is what increases the vertical diameter of the chest wall and allows the abdominal thoracic respiration to take place. So that is the normal respiration which takes place during quiet breathing, that is the abdominal thoracic respiration. In this correction, I can mention an important clinical correlation itself. As we know, the diaphragm is supplied by the phrenic nerve. Motor fibers to the muscular component is by the phrenic nerve. When there is a paralysis of phrenic nerve at any one side, let's say for the right side, then when the diaphragm is contracting, only the left side will contract and the left dome will descend down. The right dome will not descend down. And instead of descending down, because of the increased intra-abdominal pressure, the right dome will move up. And that will cause decrease in the diameter of the chest wall on the right side. And that is called paradoxical respiration. That happens when there is a unilateral paralysis of the diaphragm. Now let's take a look at the blood supply as we can see them here. This is the abdominal aorta. And we can see, arising from the abdominal aorta, this artery here. On the right side and this artery here on the left side. We can see this is the inferior phrenic artery which arises from the level of T12. This is an important blood supply of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is also supplied on the superior aspect by the superior phrenic arteries, the pericardiophrenic arteries, the musculophrenic arteries which are of branches of the internal thoracic artery. But that we cannot see here. This inferior phrenic artery incidentally also supplies the suprarenal gland. We can see the right suprarenal gland here and we can see the blood supply going to the suprarenal gland and it also supplies the left suprarenal gland which we can see here and we can see it is supplying the left suprarenal gland also. But that is just by the way. Now let's take a look at some special features about the lumbar attachment of the diaphragm. We can see an arch here in the almost in the midline. This arch. This is the median arcuate ligament. This, we can see it arising from the right side. This is going all the way and going like this. This median arcuate ligament is formed by the right crust of the diaphragm, which is attached to L1, 2, 3, and the left crust of the diaphragm, which is attached from left L1, 2. And in between, there's a tendinous portion. This is the median arcuate ligament. So this median arcuate ligament 
is one place where the diaphragm is attached in the central portion. Now, if we were to take a look a little lateral to that, we see this is the psoas major and the psoas minor muscle. And we can see a ligamentous structure at the upper limit of the fascia of the psoas, this curved structure here. This is the medial arcuate ligament on the right side. Now let's take a look at the medial arcuate ligament on the left side. And again we can see this is the psoas major and the psoas minor. And we can see the medial arcuate ligament on the left side. So this is another attachment of the diaphragm just lateral to the median arcuate ligament. And to continue, further laterally, this is the muscle which is the quadratus lumborum. The quadratus lumborum gets attached, inserted onto the twelfth rib among other insertions. And the upper limit of the quadratus lumborum fascia, there is yet another ligamentous structure here to which the fibers of the diaphragm get attached and that is known as the lateral arcuate ligament. So this is what we can see on the left side. Now let's switch on to the right side again. This is the quadratus lumborum muscle. And we can see this upper limit of the quadratus lumborum fascia. This is the lateral arcuate ligament, which I have lifted up here. This is the lateral arcuate ligament. So lateral arcuate ligament on the right side, the medial arcuate ligament, and the median arcuate ligament. So these are the attachments. Just to recap, the lateral arcuate ligament is the upper limit of the quadratus fascia. The medial arcuate ligament is the upper limit of the psoas fascia. And the med median arcuate ligament gives passage to the aorta, which I shall mention just a little while later. Let me mention a few quick words about the crust of the diaphragm, which I mentioned earlier. As I told you, this is the right crust. The right crust is bigger and they are attached to the lumbar vertebra. As it goes up, it becomes fleshy and we can see it here. And this fleshy portion curves all the way around this esophagus, which you can see here. And then it comes back again and we can see the fibers coming back and they get back to the ascending fibers on this side. So this is what constitutes the right crust of the diaphragm. And we can see that within the fleshy portion of the right crust of the diaphragm is the esophageal hiatus through which passes the esophagus. And this muscle fibers of the right crust, they act as lower esophageal sphincter. And the, further down on the left side, we can see this tendinous portion here. This is the left crust of the diaphragm which is smaller than the right crust and which gets attached from L1 to L2. And I have already referred to the two crura forming the aortic margins of the aortic hiatus. The crust of the diaphragm is penetrated by the greater, lesser and least splanchnic nerves on the right side and on the left side as they emerge from the thorax to the abdomen. So that is about the crura of the diaphragm and the attachments of the ligaments of the diaphragm. Now let's take a look at the hiatus of the diaphragm. We have three major hiatus and many minor hiatus. The first one that we can see here on the right side, the right side of the central tendon. This is the inferior vena cava hiatus. And my finger has gone into the cut portion of the inferior vena cava here. This is located at the level of T8 to the right of the midline. This is the cut margin of the inferior vena cava above and this is the other cut margin of the inferior vena cava here. In between, this missing portion was inside the liver, which has been removed. So this is, apart from giving passage to the inferior vena cava, this cable hiatus also gives passage to some of the branches of the right phrenic nerve as they come from the thorax to the abdomen. And that is the one which is responsible for referred pain to the right shoulder in case of pathology here. And it also gives passage to the lymphatics, right lymphatics from the bare area of the liver to the posterior mediastinal lymph nodes. So these are some of the other structures which go through the cable hiatus. The next one that we can see, which I have already mentioned earlier, is the esophageal hiatus, situated in the right crust muscular portion of the diaphragm. This is located at the level of T10. And we can see that the esophagus is emerging through this right crust. Apart from the esophagus, other structures which emerge from here, there are the anterior vagus nerve, we can see it here and the posterior vagus nerve. These are also the structures which pass through the esophageal hiatus. And also passing are the branches from the left gastric artery, more specifically the 
esophageal branch of the left gastric artery and the esophageal branches of the left gastric vein they also pass through the esophageal hiatus and here in this case they constitute what is known as a site of portosystemic anastomosis now let's take the next large hiatus which also i have mentioned and that is the aortic hiatus which is at the level of t12 the aortic hiatus as i mentioned is entirely within the median arcuate ligament between the two crura the left crura of the diaphragm and the right crura of the diaphragm and we can see the aorta is emerging through the aortic hiatus this is the aorta which i have lifted up here it also gives passage to the beginning of the azygous vein which is formed in the abdomen and it also gives passage to the thoracic duct but we cannot see that here for to summarize cable hiatus t8 esophageal hiatus t10 and aortic hiatus at the level of t12 thank you very much for watching so far stay tuned for the next video on the diaphragm